Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will speak to you to this morning about um, some lessons learned over my career as a trauma surgeon um, related to the way we uh, deal with the issue of peripheral vascular trauma repair. These are not common injuries, uh, and uh, most trauma surgeons nowadays don't have enough experience in uh, repairing peripheral vascular trauma um, and uh, rely on the vascular colleagues to, to do so. And I think that there are some uh, things that we must know if you're going to engage in the repair of those injuries ourselves without the help of our vascular colleagues. So just to review with you, most trauma centers use a similar algorithm for penetrating or blunt extremity trauma as far as the diagnosis of peripheral vascular injury goes. So if you have hard signs of vascular injury, active hemorrhage, expanding hematoma, or severe ischemia, you go to the operating room, you fix the injury, uh, you get an intraoperative angiogram, and, and, and things uh, go well most of the time. If, if there are no hard signs of a vascular injury, then you can use an algorithm that involves a risk, uh, risk classification uh, strategy. And one way to do it is to use the ankle breakout index <clears throat> as a screening test. So if your ABI is less than one, or if there is a, a pulse deficit uh, on physical exam, there is a much higher risk of, a, uh, of an arterial injury. Whereas if the ABI is greater than one, or there is no pulse deficit, most patients can be observed. And using the ABI has consistently has basically eliminated the need for uh, angiograms, which are invasive, costly, and uh, time consuming, and uh, not free of complications. So we basically abolish the use of uh, preoperative angiograms uh, if we uh, adopt the ABI protocol consistently. And then if the patient's in the high risk category, then you can decide if you're going to get an angiogram to plan your operation or not. But at that point, uh, most patients will need an operation. So before you, you start your operation, there are a number of things that you need to remember. And I think this is particularly important <clears throat> for the residents and young surgeons in the audience. Uh, I apologize for the nurses, but uh, I think if you understand what goes on in the operating room, you can provide better care in the ICU as well. So one thing that you need to remember, the injury vessel may be surrounded by hematoma, may be actively bleeding, and the anatomy is not a normal anatomy, particularly in patients that uh, have a, a blast component to their injuries. So don't expect those anatomy atlas pictures. You're, you're going to find a mess, and you're going to be, be prepared for this distortion of the normal anatomy. The second thing you need to, to think about is you need to look around and make sure that you have everything you need, including a good partner, including somebody perhaps with more experience than you. There is no, no, no problem in calling somebody in that has more experience than you to help you. But I'm talking about instruments, blood, or blood availability, catheters, shunts, Fogarty catheters, the right assistance, and eventually the ability to do an intraoperative angiogram, and you need to know how to do that. And then you need to have a good assessment of all associated injuries, because eventually there are more important injuries that you need to deal with, and your vascular repair will be limited to a damage control strategy of the vascular injury, and because you need to pay attention to other injuries that are more important. The second thing that I always try to teach the residents is when you're gonna prep those patients in the operating room, prep widely, because you never know what you're gonna find. So at least one joint above and one joint below of the area of interest, particularly in penetrating injuries to the extremity, and always prep the normal leg, the other leg, to harvest the saphenous vein if you need to harvest the saphenous vein. Then the basic principle of vascular trauma is obtain proximal and distal control. This is actually uh, easily said than done, but it's important to remember that 
you should avoid entering the hematoma until you obtain proximal and distal control. And if to do that, you need to make a longer incision, so be it. Make a big incision. You start the dissection proximally and away from the injury site. Don't get into the hematoma. Proceed with the dissection distally to the hematoma. And then when you have proximal and distal control uh, in, by encircling the, the, the artery with vessel loops, then you get into the hematoma. One more time, remember, the anatomy will be distorted by the injury, whether it's a blast component, whether there's fractures associated with this in blunt trauma, or will be distorted by the hematoma itself. If you find bleeding despite proximal and distal control, don't panic. Direct pressure, control bleeding, and start moving the clamps slowly or the vessel loops closer to the area of the injury. And don't forget that in some circumstances, in areas of difficult access, so in the subclavian or in the proximal femoral, you can use interluminal balloons. You can use small Foley catheters. Put those catheters in the track of the wound, inflate the balloon, and eventually you will obtain, prox you will obtain bleeding control, at least temporarily, so you can dissect the artery and bring your clamps uh, closer together. And then once that the hemostasis has been obtained, you got to ask the question, can repair be done? Can the repair uh, uh, be done safely? If you have other injuries to deal with and you get into this damage control mode, so there are the same concepts of damage control surgery in the abdomen apply to peripheral vascular injury, so vascular damage control. And there are three basic strategies, ligation, extra-anatomic bypasses, and temporary shunts. This is a case that we had not long ago of a blunt injury that transected both the common femoral artery and femoral vein. And this was a blunt mechanism, very rare injury, and uh, the patient fell and had other injuries, and we had to apply this concept of damage control. That's why you see the shunts in the artery and the vein in that picture. So you have gotta be prepared uh, uh, to, to use those uh, strategies and eventually to ligate and uh, restore flow by some other means. So here's an, an example of a, a temporary shunt uh, uh, that we left in the iliac artery, another shunt in the iliac artery. So there are several examples of the use of shunts in peripheral vascular injury. Now, once you decide that you can do the repair, the breedment of the injured vessel is important. And in gunshot wounds, usually the, the injury is more, the extent of the injury is a bigger or larger than the observed injury. So in other words, there is some, some thermal injury to the endothelium of the artery to the intima that uh, you can't see with your eyes. So eventually you think that the injury has one size, but the injury is bigger than what you see. So you rarely need to do extensive debridement in stab wounds, but you usually do that in, in gunshot wounds. And it has to be enough to expose normal intima. You've got to look inside the vessels, both ends, and assure yourself that the, the artery is normal. Don't try to save questionable tissue because you're going to pay a high price if you do that. So sometimes more is better than less. Then you've got to decide which type of repair. There are several ways. You can do a, just a lateral repair. You can do a patch angioplasty. You can do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. There are a number of different ways of doing this. Most of the time, you will need to uh, insert a substitute conduit. And eventually, if you're lazy like me, you put plastic. If you are not, you use saphenous vein. I decided that after several years, I would, I would use PTFE on everybody, and sometimes, I, I paid the price for, for the decision I made, but it's readily available. If it matches the diameter of the artery that you're dealing with, just go for it. Now, vascular surgeons that don't have a lot of experience in treating patients with vascular trauma, they make a fatal mistake because they are used to treat a chronic uh, peripheral artery uh, disease, atherosclerotic disease, and they do bypasses. Don't do bypasses without uh, addressing the injury itself because 
those will fail. So placing a bypass graft without exploring the injury site will fail and patients will develop complications. You gotta look at the injury. You gotta get into that mess and address the situation. Just going from proximal to distal without addressing the, issue, the, the injury uh, will, will create a lot of problems, including bleeding, pseudoaneurysms, thrombosis, etc. The use of the Fogarty catheter is critical in vascular repair. So before you start your repair, we remove clots by passing the Fogarty catheter proximally and distally as many times until the artery as needed until the artery is completely uh, free of clots. So there, there is a technique there. You, I, I try to use the smallest Fogarty I can. I only use the amount of fluid to inflate the balloon that's required to inflate the balloon, no more in the syringe so I don't keep pushing uh, fluid inside the balloon and the balloon will rupture inside the artery and will damage the endothelium. Uh, I advance the catheter without, with the balloon completely deflated and then if I find any resistance, I stop. I don't advance it further. I don't try to manipulate the catheter and go further because I'll perforate the artery. And when I inflate the balloon and I, st I start withdrawing the catheter, if I find resistance, again, I stop. I don't try to pull it harder because we will create more damage to the endothelium of the artery. An overinflated Fogarty balloon will cause extensive intimal injury and you're gonna pay the price, distal thrombosis, failure of your graft because of a technical error that you made during the operation without knowing it. I have the two clean pass rule, so I pass until it's clean and then I pass one more time and then it's clean again and then I'm satisfied. Uh, and, and then you can uh, continue with your repair. Heparinization, I use local heparinization. It's true that most of trauma patients that we deal with are coagulopathic, but it's important to use local heparin. The exception um, is isolated uh, single penetrating injury, uh, patients that uh, have prolonged ischemia, uh, patients with minimal risk of bleeding and long reconstruction time. Local heparinization is important, but you gotta be careful. If you use too much, and depending on the dilution of the heparin that you ask your scrub nurse to prepare for you in the operating room, you may give so much locally that patients become systemically heparinized. So 50 units per ml is the right concentration and don't use too much. Then there are, again, several techniques of vascular repair. So this is just to illustrate to you, if you've never seen one, how, uh, how we do in the operating room a simple repair, just a continuous suture. I try to choose the smallest suture material possible, and I try to avoid narrowing and, and, and tension on the suture line. If possible, always the suture line in a primary repair has to be uh, perpendicular to the axis of the vessel. So always transverse because if you do it longitudinally, you're gonna pay the price. And I've paid the price so many times, not so much in extremities, but in, in major vascular injuries in the abdomen, particularly in the vena cava, when you have a longitudinal rent and then you try to close it longitudinally, you end up with a, a significant stricture that will thrombose. So you spend a lot of time and effort for nothing. Simple end repair techniques, end-to-end -end anastomosis. Again, if you're gonna resect a piece of the artery and try to bring the ends together, if you have to pull it too hard to bring the ends together, that's probably not a good idea. It's better to put a piece of plastic or saphenous vein in the middle. But if you can do safely an end-to-end -end anastomosis, make, make sure that it's tension-free. Again, if you need to pull it too much, it's not gonna work. I try to avoid tying off multiple branches just to gain some length. People have this concept that you can tie some branches and then the ends will come together. And because you're lazy, you're avoiding to, uh, to, to, to reconstructing the flow with uh, interposition graft. Don't do that, don't be lazy. It's somebody's leg that's at risk here and you gotta perform the safest repair possible. So try not to avoid those multiple branches because they may be important if, you're, if your repair fails, they will be important for collateral circulation development and for distal flow. So uh, I try not to do that. Uh, for small arteries, particularly in kids, we don't do this in kids very often, but when you have to do it in kids, Instead of using a running suture, I use interrupted sutures, particularly for small arteries. 
And uh, I always use stay sutures, and I'll show you that in a minute. There are some technical principles in vascular anastomosis. Uh, if, you, if you don't remove the adventitia at the edge of the artery, eventually the adventitia will be caught in your, in your suture and will be imbricated inside the lumen of the artery and that's, that's a reason for failure of your repair. So clean off the edges. I always spatulate both ends of the artery to have a wider anastomosis, if you will. Always tension free. And you may consider making the conduit that you're going to use redundant to allow, allow limb extension after reconstruction. Remember, some, some, some injuries, particularly the popliteal, the legs not straightened. So we, we bend the knee to approach the popliteal artery from a medial approach. And if, you, if your conduit's too, too, too short, when you extend the artery, there will be tension in the proximal and distal anastomosis and your repair will fail. So think about those things as, as you move through the operation. The needle, this is very technical, but the needle should enter the artery wall at a right angle, a 90 degree angle. And this is a mistake that the residents make. If, if you don't place those stitches properly, you're, you're gonna cause injuries to the, to the arterial wall and bleeding at the end of your anastomosis. And I never pull the suture material to bring the edges together. If I have to do that, I just put a conduit in the middle. So stay sutures are important as you see in A, so you can decide if you put north or south or east or west. But I use stay sutures because they help me flip the artery back and forth. So I do anterior, then I do posterior or vice versa. So that's a good way to do it. Spatulation, again, it's important because instead of uh, of having a narrow anastomosis, you, you have a much wider anastomosis that, uh, and the risk of thrombosis is obviously much less. So there are several, several techniques, but again, the concept of spatulating, even if you're going to do a end-to-side anastomosis is important because your anastomosis will be longer, will be wider, and less uh, obstruction or less thrombosis will occur. This is a piece of saphenous vein. It's important to mark what's proximal and what's distal because in, in the lower extremity you have to reverse the saphenous vein for obvious reasons because of the venous valves. Uh, so I use it when there is extensive destruction, when there is contamination, or when I need to do an extensive debris, debridement of the artery. Uh, again, uh, if it's a simple interposition graft, I tend to use uh, PTFE plastic because it's faster, it's readily available off the shelf, and saves me maybe 45 minutes to an hour in the, in the operation. So here's an example, a piece of vein uh, interposed uh, in, in the artery in the lower extremity. So the repairs are, are equivalent. Uh, I think uh, there is a lot of debate whether or not PTFE carries a higher risk of infection compared to saphenous vein. The truth of the matter is, when you get one of those grafts infected, the, the suture line will blow out and bleeding will occur with plastic or with saphenous vein. So I, I don't think there is uh, truly a difference, particularly in, in, in peripheral vascular injury. Maybe in the abdomen with gross contamination, with stool in the abdominal cavity, that's a, maybe a different story. But for the lower extremity, I. Quite frankly, over the last 20 years, I have not found differences in comparing venous uh, interposition graft versus uh, PTFE. Uh, this is a piece of plastic, and as you can see, just, it works just fine, uh, just like the saphenous vein. Patch angioplasty uh, is rarely used in vascular trauma, but eventually, if you have a longitudinal tear, and you need, uh, let's say, a stab wound to a major artery, and you do the re primary repair, you know you are going to cause a significant area of stricture. So eventually, you can get a little piece of plastic or a little piece of vein and, uh, and sew to the edges of the wound, opening up uh, the wound laterally and uh, maintaining uh, arterial diameter and blood flow. So it's, it's a good strategy if you have uh, longitudinal tears, uh, usually in stab wounds. Simple repair techniques. Uh, remember, uh, if you get into this damage control, 
mode, ligation is an option in almost all venous injuries and in many arterial injuries if your goal is to get the patient out of the operating room and take the patient to the ICU for, uh, to improve uh, patient's physiology, eventually you need to ligate arteries. And obviously there is always a price that you pay. But reconstruction may be impossible due to patient's condition, may be the only way to obtain bleeding control, uh, and uh, you need to consider your options for secondary reconstruction. So once you do the repair, uh, so the dev is always in the detail, so proximal and distal flush before you finish your repair and your tireless stitch, uh, it's important to remove proximal and distal, uh, to remove clots that accumulated proximally and distal to the clamps, and it has to be done before you, you tie off your, your, last, your last stitch. Uh, you need to observe back bleeding uh, if you don't have back bleeding from the distal end, you got to go back and pass your fogarty because there's distal clot that's uh, creating the problem. So remove all the small clots from the area of the anastomosis before you finish it. And then once you're done, you need to assess the distal circulation. You need to think about stenosis of your repair, kinking. Uh, you need to uh, determine the uh, the, the presence of adequate distal flow by an intraoperative angiogram or at least a Doppler. Uh, I routinely do intraoperative, intraoperative angiograms if I have the time and if I'm not in that damage control mode and the patient is not too sick and I haven't been in the operating room for a long period of time, but at least you got to have good Doppler signs uh, 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 signals in, uh, in the lower extremity. Fasciotomy is another consideration. If you are dealing with somebody that has been ischemic due to a vascular injury to the extremity for more than four hours, you need to consider it. Some people use six hours. I like to think about it at four hours. If the, from the time to injury to the time of, of the repair is four hours, I probably don't do it. It's more than four hours. I, I consider it every single time. And the only way you're going to prevent a disaster is doing it early, in my opinion. When I ligate the popliteal vein, popliteal arteries, I do fasciotomies routinely. And eventually, you can measure compartment pressure uh, and, and determine if it's greater than 30, you do fasciotomies. Although, in the operating room, I think you, you look at your repair, you look at the time that it it, take, it took for you from injury to definitive repair, and then you use your judgment uh, and you don't need to measure pressures. Eventually, prophylactic fasciotomies uh, will save uh, a lot of limbs. Their fasciotomies are not easy to do. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, call your orthopedic colleagues. They do this more often than we do, but you gotta decompress all four compartments of the lower extremity. If you forget to decompress all four, if you leave behind, the posterior deep compartment that's right behind the fibula and, uh, and the tibia, you are gonna pay the price because those muscles will die. This is the most common mistake general surgeons make when they do fasciotomies. They make an incision, they see the muscle, the superficial muscle bulging out, and they think that's adequate decompression. They forget to decompress the deep uh, compartment. So here's how we do it. Uh, we make a, a long uh, lateral incision in the leg. Uh, you will open the first, the first facial uh, layer. You see some muscle bulging. Uh, don't be satisfied. Uh, you gotta go uh, under the fibula and uh, decompress uh, the deep uh, compartment as well. So how do you ensure appropriate coverage of your vascular repair? Sometimes the injuries are so extensive that uh, there's not enough tissue to cover your vascular repair. So you may call your plastic surgery colleagues to help you rotate a muscle flap to cover your repair if, uh, if possible. Um, eventually you, you can use um, uh, skin grafts or, or, or pig skin uh, for temporary closure. And if coverage is impossible due to extensive tissue destruction, you may need to consider, instead of primary repair, uh, ligation in an extra anatomic uh, uh, 
route for your bypass. Why sometimes th those repairs fail? And this is what is important. If you take this home, I'll, I'll be happy. One, it's most of the time it, it is a technical error. Tension in the anastomosis is the number one cause for failure. Lack of distal flow, if you didn't remove all the clots with your fulgur catheter, you thought the artery was clean, but it was not. If there is no back flow, you gotta go back and pass the fulgur catheter again. Lack of inflow, so if there is a proximal obstruction that you didn't identify. If your anastomosis is, is narrowed, Kinking of the conduit is eventually uh, an issue, and eventually you need to be uh, creative in the operating room to, uh, in, to resolve the problem of kinking without uh, having to take down your anastomosis. Failure to cover the repair of the graft. Those grafts, particularly saphenous vein, they will desiccate, they will get infected, they will uh, blow out. Uh, and if you don't determine the adequacy of the repair, the completion of the procedure, this is also very common. People forget about that. So that's it. Thank you very much. Again, it was a pleasure for me to be here and a pleasure to be the keynote speaker. <laughs>